where the executing authority is a prosecutor. There's no mention of a court. And in Germany's case, it's either the prosecutor or the Ministry of Justice. Now, if in fact that means that it is a prosecutor not conducting a court-type hearing, is that something that the issuing authority in um, Westminster should take into account in deciding whether or not to um, ask Austria, Germany or Latvia right. to execute a warrant? Well, well, an executing public prosecutor clearly is in a different um, position because he isn't classically in the same way capable of being immediately labelled as being partial because he, he will never be party to the dispute of fact and law as to whether or not a, a, a crime has been committed in the issuing state. So there isn't the same automat automatic assumption that he's going to be incapable of fulfilling the criteria. Uh, the, the, the second point is that in most of the countries, and again, I, I can't say all, but in most of the countries, there will be a domestic process of administrative or judicial review, which then permits a collateral challenge to a decision made by the executive in a way that may satisfy Article 54. Uh, four. It's not clear because I, I can't say whether it's an automatic right or not of the sort that's normally required to satisfy Article 54. Uh, but uh, that is, that's the difficulty in equiparating, as Ms. Rose tried to do, the two and saying they must have the same characteristics because I would respect this a bit, that a French or German public prosecutor would have no interest in the issue between the CPS and John Smith, who's in Germany. And he could be impartial and independent of the executive for the purpose of assessing the need for detention and the legality of the arrest. Before, before these warrants are issued, uh, is there sometimes a degree of cooperation through Eurojust and other um, joint prosecutorial bodies, or perhaps Eurojust is the only one? Well, um, again, I, I think the, the, the answer is I don't know. I've, I've only experienced two or three cases in, in, in practice where that's gone through. Um, Eurojust and indeed a number of the European bodies provide very clear guidance now. There's a handbook on how one completes an EAW. Um, there's um, a little wi uh, wizard you can use on one of the websites which will fill in an EAW for you. And so probably the need for close communication has died away. But certainly you would expect to see some prior investigative um, activity to identify where the person concerned is. And that may be done through Eurojust. Eurojust, it may be done through Interpol, it may be done through police to police channels. I mean, I just wondered whether your clear separation between <clears throat> the public prosecutor in an issuing country mm. and in an executing country was quite so um, clear in um, some cases, at least. Um, oh, you, I you... see. Um... I mean, they liaise informally, don't they? Isn't that the whole point of. Um... Eurojust, wherever it sits in either Brussels or The Hague, I Yes, guess. well, uh, Eurojust is, again, one of those bodies that, uh, as you know, suggests that um, since its statute requires them to be judicial authorities, that they can be both prosecutors and judges. But uh, uh, so far as that's concerned, no, uh, the main contact is, in fact, with the liaison magistrates. That, that's the principal means of communication into the various countries. I think they're now, with all our main extradition part parties, we have a liaison magistrate in Paris, in Rome, and that's who is contacted in the first place. Could, could I ask you one much more basic question, just to get it clear? Miss Rose's submission was that the judicial authorities, whatever that means, mm. of the issuing state, have to make a judgment on proportionality. You completely reject that, do you? I, I, I do. So that, that's a, a basic difference between you. It is a basic difference between my submission, all that is required is conformity with Article 5.1, that you act in conformity with the domestic law for a non-arbitrary reason. In other words, you, you are doing it on grounds that are either C, because there is a reasonable ground to suspect him and you want to bring him before a court, or 
the extradition ground that you want to arrest him for the purpose of extradition. Mr. Montgomery, just as we come to the domestic legislation, I mean, it's far from the, um, <coughs> from the uh, um, framework decision uh, and all you've shown us so far, um, indicating that judicial authority has a single fixed meaning. I mean, what we've seen is it means different things to different people and indeed different things to the same person, depending on the particular circumstances in which you are having to mm. consider and apply. Is that right? Yes, it'll mean different things from country to country, uh, both in the constitutional sense and in the popular sense. It will mean uh, different things depending on what one's assumptions are about the term judicial. Is it and curial it's... or is it associated with the administration of justice more widely? And that's why we submit it must have clearly here in the framework de uh, decision and in the Act an autonomous meaning that's capable of encompassing and permitting for the varying systems that exist in the states of the Union. Well, it, it, th th that is not an explanation of what autonomous means. I think we, we'd all readily agree it must have an autonomous meaning. Whether that has to be the widest possible meaning is a, is a very different point, isn't it? Well, save that, the, the purpose of the framework directive was to simplify the process. To simplify it while, while handing it over to judicial authorities. Well, uh, with respect, no, my lord. In the case of the, uh, European, the simplified European Convention scheme, to continue it, to continue it in the way it had emerged, namely that it was then being done prosecutor to prosecutor in all the countries we've looked at where they are the sole source of uh, arrest and request for extradition. Germany, Holland, Belgium. Well, I, to my Lord's, second part of my Lord's yes. question, would you say that the term judicial authority in, in, in some states is wide enough to embrace both the issuing judicial authority and the executing judicial authority, notwithstanding those who will be asked to do those two functions will not be the same body. Indeed, yes. yes. You're not suggesting that it has a different meaning. No, 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 no. Uh, no if you put it, issuing or depending on the function, what, depending on the function and the domestic laws, the characteristics of the judicial authority will vary from state to state. But, but also within the state. Within the state. Yeah, um, within the state, absolutely. The type no, of necessarily, necessarily. You will vary yes. depending upon its ne function. Necessarily within the state. Because unquestionably, the, 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 uh, but because of Article 5.4, whoever reviews the legality of detention has to be a court. The, that, that's the requirement. So depending on what the function is, it, as I say, it may be that there'll be an executing authority who's capable of not being a court because they, they're just going to arrest. Uh, but there will unquestionably also have to be an executing authority or somebody as a result of the provisions of the domestic law, who is able to comply with Article 5.4. So, uh, the Extradition Act. Uh, and uh, I'm conscious in addressing the Extradition Act that some of your lordships, and certainly my lady, has a relatively weary familiarity with the background of extradition generally, but I do just want to touch on it because of the weight placed upon the Backing of Warrants Republic of Ireland Act and the suggestion that somehow that suggests that judicial authority had a fixed meaning within uh, the language of extradition in this country. Uh, and uh, I, as the court, I'm sure, is aware, judicial authority with its specialised meaning in the Backing of Warrants Republic of Ireland Act it is there to cater for exclusively the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland's judicial system, which only contemplates warrants of arrest, which are being backed, that have been issued by courts or judges. Whether they're called peace commissioners or magistrates, it doesn't really matter. But the wider schemes of extradition, which have operated certainly since 1870, have never so limited the requirement either in relation to the identity of the person who issues the domestic warrant 
in the foreign state, or the person who requests extradition. In, in fact, quite the reverse. The picture has been that all that is required is one, a foreign warrant that is, as a matter of domestic foreign law, lawful, can come from a prosecutor, can come from a judge, and two, a request from, normally, a, a member of the foreign state's executive. But do these earlier acts use the expression of judicial authority? Uh, they use, well, the 1870 Act uses the expression judicial document. Uh, and a, a, a judicial document authorising arrest. And that's been held to be wide enough to include a, a judicial document issued by a public prosecutor. Or a foreign or a ministry. Uh, indeed. <laughs> and, and the same for the Commonwealth scheme, as you appreciate, um, under the Fugitive Offenders Act, both 1881 and 1967, which was the scheme that operated throughout the Commonwealth. Again, in relation to that act, there, there was no insistence upon the particular source of the warrant. It simply had to be a, a warrant which had been lawfully authorised to be issued in the colony, Commonwealth country, or other state. And the reason for that actually was quite clear, that in many of the then colonies, certainly under the 1881 Act, there were no judges. It, it was normally a governor general's order that was the lawful basis for the arrest that was then sent to the United Kingdom and then acted on under the, either the 1881 scheme or the 1967 scheme. And so I, I do caution the court against any assumption that there has ever been, as a matter of practice, any obligation to assess the independence of the person, uh, impartiality of the person who issues the warrant, or to assess the independence and impartiality of the person who requests surrender. That has simply never been the law. And so if it is the view of the court that it emerges with clarity from the language of the 2003 Act, it would be a remarkable departure as a matter of history from all that had gone before. So uh, just to deal with the legislative history, uh, again, we've tried to provide the court with a comprehensive picture. And it starts, in fact, with an earlier report uh, of the House of Lords European Union Committee, one four months before the one you were shown by Miss Rose this morning. And that is in the small, this morning's hearing bundle, the one with the handwriting on the spine, behind flag two. Behind flag two, my lord. Here, two. And it's page 12 in the bottom right-hand corner. This is the... Who was chairing subcommittee the then? I'm Scott? sorry, my lord. It's, it's a letter from Lord Brabazon to the Home Office Minister. Really. And it's bottom of page 12 under the heading Protection of the Rights of the Individual. If you look on page 18, yes. It, sh it should be written in. I don't, it should be written in hand. I don't know whether. No, 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 no. It is. I was just looking. It's Lord Scott. It's not. I mean, the point is, the, the, these are subcommittee E. Lord Manson, I recollect all very clearly. And I mean, this was when he was the chairman, as you yes, see yes, from indeed. page 18. In, indeed. And uh, I'm picking it up because obviously this is the product of the deliberations of the committee encapsulated in Lord Brabazon's letter. And you can see at the bottom page 12, they acknowledge 
that judicial authorities in the context that it's used in the framework decision may, as they say, include prosecuting authorities. You see that in parentheses. 